the workshop page, and there are live links buttons on both of those. Okay. okay, great. Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today about the nature of interstellar organics and their relationship to the solar system. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. The key questions that I see are, what are the primordial sources of organics and volatiles? And what are the processes that govern their formation, evolution, and delivery throughout the solar system? My hope is that once we identify the problems of interest, we can figure out a way to collaboratively bring together experts in theoretical modeling, laboratory experimentation, and astronomical observation folks so that we can address this. Because I said, as I said in the uh, opening welcome remarks, I think the, the question begs whether or not there's a relationship between the planetary architecture that we see today and the inventory of organic and volatile material. And if we can unscramble the egg by understanding what we see today with a look back to what we think we started with, then that will teach us a lot, not only about our own solar system, but about other forming uh, planetary systems as well. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start with a reminder of the cycle that interstellar dust goes through. And I think this picture really starts at the top with the red giant phase. When a star has evolved and is in the red giant phase and then um, gives back its material to the diffuse interstellar medium, that material provides the feedstock that will later, some of it survive, and go on to become incorporated in both the diffuse interstellar medium cloud and then the dense molecular cloud. And it's within the dense molecular cloud that the magic really happens, because that's where the ice can form on dust grains. And I'm sure all of you have heard that within that ice on the dust grain, complex chemistry can occur through the processing of the materials, the basic uh, elements that are there, and so on. What we've come to appreciate now is that as that dense molecular cloud ends up forming stars, whether a low mass or a high mass star, it doesn't matter, the nearness of those ice grains to the newly forming star is going to allow those complex molecules that have formed on the ice to go back into the gas phase and then you can get even more complex chemistry. So today I'm going to be telling you my understanding of where we are in terms of understanding what goes into that protostellar phase. Next slide. OK, so this is just summarizing some of what I just said. Basically, carbon-rich products are ejected from the evolved stars into the diffuse ISM. That material cools as it travels away from the star. and at times, it will fractionate and break apart. We know this because we see, through infrared absorption, um, aliphatic hydrocarbon chains. They're not very long, but we see them in absorption in a lot of different lines of sight throughout our galaxy and also in other galaxies. So this is a very widespread and ubiquitous material. And it locks up about 10% of the elemental carbon in the IFM, so it's important. Now, another component of the ISM are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And those are, are chains, uh, circles, uh, rings of carbon up to about 50 atoms. You can see the pictures down there on the bottom. On the left-hand side is the aliphatic chain that I just spoke about. And then the one right next to it would, would be the PAH. So about 5% of the carbon is locked up in pods. And uh, we see them in many different environments. We see them in emission, primarily. We're looking for them in absorption. There's some indication some places we may see them in absorption, but mostly we see them in emission. There's another component that has uh, become very interesting to us, and it's uh, fullerenes, C60, the buckyball. Uh, and uh, you can see that in the lower right-hand corner. C60 is very stable and is found close to stars. Now, it's really hard to form C60 there. So we think it's likely formed through the destruction of pods. How does this happen? Well, first the hydrogen bonds break off of the pods, and you form graphene sheets. 
So that's the, the ring, the sheet that you see next to the fullerene. Then the carbon bonds break to form small chains and cages. And we think that following this, some of the cages somehow join together to form the C60 fullerene. But they have definitely been detected now, and they're no longer just a theoretical idea. Next slide, please. This is an infrared spectrum that shows that we have detected the aliphatic chains of hydrocarbons. These are CH2 and CH3 groups that like to form small chains. And they have a very distinctive signature. They have absorption bands at around 3.4 microns. This is duplicated through laboratory experiments. We understand this material uh, fairly well at the functional group level. The dust in our galaxy and other galaxies contains these aliphatic hydrocarbons. And it's interesting that they're also quite similar to what we see in the Murchison meteorite. And it could be that this is just the way chemistry happens, and so you would just form it again in our solar system later. But some people are also wondering if somehow this hardy refractory material that survives in the harsh environment, the diffuse interstellar medium, could have survived all the way into the protostellar nebula and perhaps later into the solar system. Next slide, please. This is another infrared spectrum. Here I'm trying to show the difference between the near-infrared 3.4 micron region that you just saw with the aliphatic hydrocarbon and the corresponding 5 to 8 micron region, which is rich with the deformation bending modes of, of the, uh, the same material that would cause the stretching modes for these aliphatics in the 3.4 micron region, they should have a corresponding component at these longer wavelengths. Now, this is a hodgepodge, this thing that I'm showing you here, because it is really all that we can do right now. This is two different lines of sight. This is not the same direction. Both of them are towards the galactic center, where there's a lot of dust between us and the galactic center, and so we're able to measure the diffuse interstellar medium. But uh, what we would like, of course, is to get one spectrum, many spectra, but one that covers the complete uh, 2 to, to uh, 10, at least, micron region and uh, be able to see the complete fingerprint of this material. So what I'm saying here is that only functional groups can be seen in the near-infrared. Full molecular identification awaits the acquisition of longer wavelengths, moderate resolution, mid-IR spectra. And so this is why I'm so excited about JWST. Uh, I really can't wait to get the rest of the puzzle pieces. Next slide. Based on all of the information that we had 15 years ago now on the hydrocarbons in the diffuse interstellar medium, we were able to piece together a notional depiction of the basic structural and molecular character of carbonaceous interstellar dust. So this is accurate to what we knew at that point about emission and absorption of all the characters that I've talked about so far. This is just a notional idea, uh, but I thought it was illustrative of what a piece of an interstellar grain might look like. And the diagram credit for this goes to Max Bernstein. This diagram is actually from a paper that Lou Alamandola and I published back in 2002. And uh, Max did a great job of putting together something when we just gave him a number of bonds of all these different ones and said, what would this look like? OK, next slide. OK, so until now, we've been talking about the diffuse interstellar medium. But if you'll think back to the cycling, the next stage is the dense molecular cloud. So this is just a beautiful image from the Spitzer Space Telescope that shows a region. This is Eta Carina, where newborn stars are embedded in these pillars of flowing interstellar dust and gas. We will be uh, talking about what happens inside that region next. Next slide, please. Okay, first off, before a protostar is ever born, an awful lot of interesting chemistry happens. The quiescent ice evolution, which is shown up here in this beautiful figure put together by Melissa McClure, uh, shows that as the interstellar dust, which starts off as a silicate core, we believe, or could start as a silicate core, could be a carbon core, uh, as it accretes simple ices, 
which you can see uh, moving from left to right. Um, uh, as AV increases, AV is a measure of how deep in the cloud you're going. So an AV from 0 to 3, you're maybe at the edge of the cloud. And then from 3 to 10, you've moved a little deeper in. It's colder. It's denser. Water, um, CO2, methane, and ammonia ice may form. And then a little later, deeper into the cloud, it's even colder, and CO will join the ice layers. But what we're also seeing at that point, the comms, the complex organic molecules are starting to form. And what it takes to do that is some sort of energy. This could be UV photolysis. If there's UV light from a newly forming star just nearby, this could be cosmic ray uh, interactions as the cosmic rays go through the cloud. This could be thermal. Whatever it takes to break the bonds apart so that the simple molecules can then reform into more complex material. That's what's going on here before the protostar has even formed. And here's the spectrum to show you the kinds of things that we can learn by looking in dense molecular clouds towards a bright background star that can show us the absorption along the line of sight through the cloud. Next slide, please. OK, so the formation pathways for creating organics. About 40 years ago, it was thought that ion molecule chemistry in the gas phase governed the chemistry of the interstellar medium. So ion molecule chemistry, this just means that an ion, either positive or negative, uh, interacts with the molecule. And at least one bond is broken, and one bond is formed, and a new species is born. We thought that that's what was going on, and that there were just relatively few puzzle pieces missing, and pretty soon we would understand what we see. But that turned out not to be the case. Because it, when you do ion molecule chemistry only in the gas phase with the simple materials, you get to CO, but then you can't go any further because CO is very unreactive in the gas phase. So over the last 20 years, we've come to fully appreciate that the material ingested from the evolved stars plays an important role. And then as that material goes into the dense clouds, providing the feedstock for the newly forming ices and materials, the, the more interesting chemistry occurs. In fact, we now know that there's a complex layering of ices and organics on dust grains before stars form. And that was just shown in the slide before this. And the other point to make is that regardless of the processing methods, cosmic rays, UV, or thermal, getting to methanol is the key. It turns out methanol is a, a wonderful molecule to have because later it will be released back into the gas when the protostar does form, and then all kinds of great stuff happens. Next slide. This is a beautiful diagram that Max Bernstein, Scott Sanford, and Lou Alamandola published in Scientific American a long time ago now, still true. This shows exactly what I've been talking about with the ice forming on the core of the refractory dust grain inside the dense molecular cloud, and how the radiation processing of the ices can produce a more complex refractory, and that just means very hardy, organic material. Next slide. So dust grains are the meeting places where species come to mate. The accretion of gas phase species starts an active surface chemistry that converts atomic oxygen into water and nitrogen and carbon into ammonia and methane. The CO accretes a little later and is then hydrogenated. So by this time, you formed formaldehyde and methanol. A complex mixture of layering and ices is created before stars even form. I've said that three times now for a reason. This was something that we did not fully appreciate until relatively recently. And it happens on a time scale about 10 to the fourth years. And this is a very interesting time scale because it's really close to the time scale for massive star formation. Low mass stars take a lot longer, but massive stars can form quickly. Once the star forms, those ices nearby can release their complex organic molecules, or COMs, back into the gas. But now, instead of CO in the gas, you have methanol. Methanol loves to transfer methyl groups, CH3 groups, to a wide range of receptors. And this leads to the formation of all kinds of things. For example, dimethyl ether, 
and methylformate. And these have both been detected by ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. So these two are no longer just theoretical constructs. They've been detected. Next slide. This is a complicated slide that I won't spend much time on, but I just want to point out this is how you get to methanol. On the grain surface, starting with CO, that very unreactive species in the gas phase can now be hydrogenated. And if you just look at the red boxes, it's very simple. You can see how the CO goes straight to methanol. There are a lot of references on this page. This talk is being recorded. If you're interested in any of this, I really encourage you to go back and look up these references. Next slide. OK, here, this is a beautiful uh, spectrum uh, taken uh, by um, uh, Dartois et al. and also uh, has been published by Adwin Bugert. And this is showing the kinds of ices that you see along the line of sight uh, towards a massive young stellar object. Uh, so what you're looking at here along this line of sight, you're seeing the dust. Uh, dust grains that have formed these ices, but the comms, the more commercial uh, uh, complex material that we were talking about, those things are closer to the star. They've probably already come off of the ice grain and they're in the gap. What you're seeing here are the things that are remaining on the ice uh, along that line of sight. Next slide. So we've gone through the diffuse interstellar medium, we've gone through the dense cloud, and now we're ready to form a protostar. When we do that, we're going to form our solar nebula and our planetesimals. This is a beautiful painting that uh, Bill Hartman did uh, many years ago, and uh, I still love it because it really makes me feel like we're there. From what did those planetesimals form? It turns out the material that they formed from is hugely important. Of course, the processing that happens to them afterwards is also very important. But just for a moment, consider uh, the impact if the terrestrial planets that scattered, uh, the planetesimals that scattered inward towards the terrestrial planets are made of two extreme materials. And one is, what if they were primarily H-chondrite, stony, iron-rich material? Then the environment of the inner planets that gets bombarded with these or gets accreted, uh, you know, made out of them, will be highly reduced. Think methane, ammonia, and water. Now, formaldehyde in the presence of ammonia in a watery environment plus energy can yield amino acids. So that's kind of interesting, right? On the other hand, you could get a very oxidized environment uh, if the bombardment were from carbonaceous chondrites. And in this case, if you want to think about uh, what's being delivered as the building blocks of life, you're going to have to bring in some additional building blocks from the outside for some of that other material because it's not going to form in that environment. Next slide, please. So this is why I really think it's important to try and understand the architecture of the planetary system um, and, these, and what these planetesimals were made from because it seems to me that where they went and what they took as a hostess gift is really important. So here we're looking at a theoretical model developed by Tesla and Sanford, and uh, also Newth and Johnson uh, did something very similar. And these models of the early solar nebula show something so interesting to me. It shows that icy grains can travel via convection to high latitudes above the midplane. Now, we used to think that all the processing happened within uh, the midplane uh, as you moved Closer into the star, you would get processed, and further out, not much would happen. But this opens up a whole new world because if they can actually travel up, they're able to get some of that UV fluence from the star in a different location. So they could be out further in that disk. They could have some different types of ices at that point and go up and get processed. And so it just changes the chemistry uh, of what, what could be happening here. I don't know a lot about this, but I know I want to know more. So I would really love to find people who do this kind of theoretical modeling and combine it with people who want to do observations with JWST of some of these uh, systems that are in this stage right now. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're at the outer edge of our solar system. This is an artistic representation of the current solar system with the extended population of trans-Neptunian objects. And the Kuiper Belt, per se, is, encompasses the bodies that orbit the sun close to the ecliptic plane. And they range in average heliocentric distance from about 30 to 55 AU. Collisions and gravitational perturbations within this TNO population inject icy bodies into the inner solar system where they can appear as comets. Now if we go to the next slide. We have Pluto and Charon. They're the largest known members of the Kuiper Belt population. They consist of rock and ice, and they've differentiated by heating from the interior. The red-brown color uh, on their surfaces result from local processing of the native ices and atmospheric gas uh, by UV and charged particles in the space environment. This is, of course, a beautiful New Horizons image. And you're going to hear a lot more about Pluto tomorrow when Dale Cruikshank gives his talk. But this is part of what drove me to want to have this workshop. I was hearing about the organics forming on Pluto and, and this, this environment. And then I was listening to our survey team members give their monthly reports. And they were talking about the Carmen on all these other different bodies closer to the Earth. And it just occurred to me that we need to put this all together and try and understand what it means in the context of what we think came into that protosolar nebula and what we think happened later. The other, the next slide, please. And the, the, the next part of the solar system that really grabbed my attention is the fact that uh, the Saturn system contains numerous smaller icy bodies, one of which is a captured Kuiper Belt object, maybe more than one, but the one that I'm most interested in uh, is, is shown here, <coughs> CB. The dust ejected from a relatively recent collision on CB spirals towards Saturn, coating the surfaces of Iapetus and Hyperion with material from its interior. So if CB is a primitive planetesimal from the Kuiper Belt region, we know it's captured. But if it's still primitive, we're seeing that material as it once was. And this may really help us unscramble the egg. Next slide, please. OK, so in summary, we've talked about the origin and evolution of organic material from evolved stars to the interstellar medium, the dense clouds forming new stars, and how all of this provides the feedstock for our solar nebula. We've learned that a complex layering of ices and organics exists even before a star forms. Some outer solar system bodies they preserve the original material from which they formed, including captured objects, such as Saturn's moon CB. They can help us understand the composition and degree of processing of that nebular material. And understanding the initial conditions when planetesimals formed can better feed theoretical models and new lab experiments as we try to discern which planetesimals went where and what they brought with them. Tracing carbon throughout the solar system today can help us unscramble the egg, better understanding other planetary systems as well as our own. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Yvonne. Can everybody hear me? Right. Yes, I okay. can hear you. Uh, that was great. And uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions for Yvonne. So, um, Ashcon, will I see either people typing or raising their hand? Correct. You'll see folks typing. Typing. Okay. And if anyone's on the telecom line, they're able to speak as well. They're able to okay. speak at will. Okay. Okay. So, go ahead. Okay. So, Rachel Klima is clapping. That was really neat, and I agree. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can I see the chat box? Okay, we're calling up the chat box here too, so maybe I can. Okay, great. And I think Diane. Uh, Amanda, um, you're in the dark. Yeah, Amanda, do you want to turn the lights on in your room? It's, it's just the main switch. There you go. 
Okay. So Diane uh, wants to know, do we have an idea of how much aliphatic versus aromatic bonds are in the different phases? Good. Uh, thank you, Diane. That, that's a great question, and uh, we've been working on it. Um, I think to, we have guesses, we have estimates. I'm not sure I believe any of them. Can I can I can I interrupt with a with a question about the question though? Okay. So by different phases, Diane, do you mean like the diffuse interstellar medium, the dense cloud, that? I'm assuming that is what That's she means. That's what you're thinking. Okay, good. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry. Yes, and the protosolar cloud. So I think that's a really critical question uh, because it will tell us more about uh, you know when stuff starts breaking apart, when it starts reforming, and and how, how things are shifting. Uh, but I just don't know that we have enough good observational data yet for me to believe any of the ratios that we see. Uh, but it's also something that we're working on in the solar system. And uh, Dale has been leading an effort to do exactly that. Maybe he'll mention some of that tomorrow as well. But uh, I think for the interstellar medium, we are desperately awaiting uh, JWST, because it's going to give us all of that stuff in, uh, I think, a blink of the eye. Okay. Tom Orlando asks, are the grains cycling above and below the midplane, mostly silicate or carbon core? We have seen mass 32 when dealing with carbon, which is likely methane, but 32 is likely oxygen on silicate. Well, that's interesting, Tom. Uh, the, so by grain cycling above and below the midplane, uh, you're talking about the Chesla model. And uh, I did talk to him at a Gordon conference uh, earlier, about, about a year ago. But uh, he indicated to me that they were just trying various different things. I don't know that he had any uh, specific, at that time, I don't think he had any specific insight um, to which one was, um, he was just trying both. I'm, I'm sorry, I really don't have an answer for that. That's really his work. But uh, that's interesting, your finding there. Okay, Mike DeSanti has a question. Are crystalline versus amorphous phases of ice of ices seen or distinguished? Oh, yes. Okay, absolutely. So I found it very interesting when I was uh, moving from the interstellar medium back into the solar system that uh, you know we we tend to look at amorphous phases a lot in our ices in the interstellar medium, and uh, and when they um, get warm, of course, they they can become crystalline. Uh, but here in the uh, in the solar system, it seems to go the other way. At least people seem to be talking uh, more about crystalline and, uh, and now more recently about amorphous. Um, but in the interstellar medium, yes, you can definitely distinguish between the crystalline and amorphous phases of ice. Most of the places where uh, where I live in the interstellar medium are so cold that they're always amorphous. Hmm. Okay. Is typing. Need you to type faster, Dan. <laughs> okay. We talked about development of organics from ices on the grains in the solar nebula. How much ice goes into the organic? Oh gosh, this is a great question too. I'm hoping that laboratory, new laboratory experiments will help us address that. The uh, the question of What's left over after you form these ices and how much you started with is a good one. I mean, my impression right now is that in the lab experiments, um, you know, they're, they're mixing the kinds of ices that make sense for an interstellar environment, and then they're bombarding them or, or UV photolyzing them or whatever. And uh, what they're studying is the residue. I'm not sure people have really thought too much about, um, you know, what's remaining afterwards. So that's that's an interesting idea, Dan, and um, uh, perhaps you have some ideas on on what should be done next to try and quantify that. Okay, so my question, Dan says, my question comes from the really low water content in 67P. Where is that water? Ugh. You know, who I want to have address this question is Diane Wooden. Diane, can you type in 
anything about 67P. Diane is a common expert, but she also comes from the interstellar medium. So uh, we are kindred souls here. And she is talking now. Sorry. Dan says all I have are questions. I'm afraid that's all I have too, Dan. You know, uh -huh. I've, been, I've been locked into management for the last 10 years, so I'm doing my best to claw my way back into research. But, uh, but I appreciate your questions, and they're going to help us go forward. Okay, we're waiting for Diane to finish typing. No pressure, Diane. I thought Bill Botkey might have a thing or two to say about some of the comments I made. I don't know if Bill is. Are we on speaker? Well, yeah, but Diane first had a response, and then let's Yeah, yeah, first we're going to go to Diane, but I was just trying to give Bill a heads up. Okay. Did you see her thing about water and CO2? Okay, so Diane says water and CO2 are separate, are separate components from the dust. Water is in ice, not in hydrated minerals. In the comment. In the comment. Okay. Really low water content, 67P. Water is in ice, not in hydrated minerals. Um, I don't. I'm not sure it answers the question, but Diane's typing more. It's really hard to do this. Uh, I think if uh, if someone is speaking tomorrow. Yeah. So Diane is speaking tomorrow. So uh, so Dan, I think she can address this question tomorrow. Maybe. How about that? Oh, she says one more thing. Water content. Content. How low did he think the water content is? It's usually 50. 50. 50. I think you two need to have a conversation at this point. You guys can chat. Yes, you also guys can. Definitely. While this is going forward, you can still talk. But Diane does say, I will show that samples from comets and carbonaceous chondrites with nanoglobules of organics without silicate cores, just nano to micron size organic domain. Okay, she's got samples. She has a note about non-Greenberg model. Okay, Diane, I'm going to let you explain all of that tomorrow. <laughs> Great. So, Bill, did you have anything to say about the dynamics or yes. anything? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know if this was a, a good time to talk about this or not. So, um, well, there's a lot of interesting modeling that's going on right now that, uh, to, to say briefly, it suggests a lot of our carbonaceous chondrates may have formed in the outer solar system or beyond Jupiter. And there may be, a, let's, the likelihood is that some of our most primitive carbonaceous chondrates may be coming from sort of the primordial Kuiper belt. But other carbonaceous chondrates, maybe like CM chondrates and the rest, may have actually formed in the giant planet zone. And so the question I was going to ask is, how does processing after you form a planetesimal matter in terms of making our different carbonaceous meteorites? Because there are, there are distinct differences between, let's say, something that's a like a Tagish Lake or CI versus what's a CM. And how does that affect some of the things that um, we want to do with, or how does that affect our interpretation of carbon in terms of delivery and what it can do? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think basically you're saying what is it, I, I don't want to be cavalier here, but almost what does it matter if it's pristine or not? Uh, At some level, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, there's one thing to identify it, and then there's one thing, another thing to see, okay, uh, what kind of carbon right. did we get at Earth? Is, is that maybe a way to put it? Yes, yes. And, and I think the, the reason it matters, if it can even be done, if we can unscramble that egg, is that it might tell us more about exoplanetary systems than it tells us about our own. I mean, in our own, we just know that it happened and whatever was delivered was enough in this led to you know the situation we're in now. And that's that's interesting and that's great. But if we ever really want to make predictive um, estimates for exoplanets or understand the exoplanet data that we may be getting in the future, uh, I think understanding when that stuff got processed or did it make its way all the way in in a pristine manner, um, you know, that's my guess is that that's where that would come in use handy. It, it may be the other comment I would make is that essentially in this workshop, but elsewhere, is that, you know, I think some people might assume that um, that all the carbon we have is maybe, maybe like, let's say, just from the asteroid belt, or that's where they look at it. With some of the new dynamical models, 
it's really suggesting that our meteorite collection to some degree may be sampling almost everything that exists in our solar system all the way out to many tens of AU. And it, even some of the primordial stuff that formed the giant plant zone, which is a really exciting way to think about things, but then we have to think about, all right, so suppose you suppose a given sample came from the Jupiter zone or from the Saturn zone or from the Eurozone. zone, what does that mean? Like, like what, what questions can we ask? And what does that say about our understanding of these materials and giant planet formation? So it, it's just a lot of interesting stuff. I think so. It's just absolutely fascinating. And, uh, yes, I look forward to working with you and others much more on questions just like that. Okay, Amanda, I think that might be it for the questions. Okay, I um, I had a, a question for you that's a little more general, um, Yvonne, and that is um, in terms of the work that you're doing, um, what are your open questions that you uh, hope to talk about or learn about at this workshop and at a follow-on workshop? So where hmm. can we be thinking of going um, with this workshop and the next one for your okay. stuff? Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, actually, they're kind of separate. The work that I'm currently <laughs> doing, I've just been immersed in writing uh, 10 JWST proposals mm -hmm. uh, right before that delay. And so I just want to mention that the point of doing that is that I'm working with groups of people all over the world, and, and these different groups want to study that interstellar dust at all those different phases. So we have, for instance, within dense clouds alone, several proposals that will look at just the class zero protostar region, or the class one protostar, or class two, all the way up to edge on disks, where you would look at stars forming in a, in a disk um, in the diffuse interstellar medium. Similarly, we're trying to get that complete spectrum that I, I talked about. So all of that will hone in and perfect our understanding of what it is that actually went into the protosolar nebula. The way it connects to this workshop is a little unclear, but I have a feeling there are two ways to approach this problem. And so one is what I'm trying to do, hope to do, uh, with my colleagues to, to look at what came in. But then with you guys, I hope to look at what we've already got. And maybe there's some way that those two can meet in the middle if we combine the right theoretical models, the right lab experiments, and the observations all together. Right. OK, good. Really interesting. Were you going to say something? No, I'm okay. just trying to understand why our screen is so dark. I think it was someone playing with the contrast. Oh. No, I think what's happening is the camera is aimed up at the lights. And so it's oh, did it move? Well, I, I moved it because it was up before. Oh. But I think if you get it off of that upper light, it will brighten up. Anyway, I, this is not, no one needs to hear this. Okay, well, I'm <laughs> up next, right? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yes, Amanda, you are next. Okay, I'm next. So, so I'm going to uh, share.